Mexico is the most dangerous country in Latin America for reporters. And the reporter got his head blown off. It's that simple. In 2003, Forbes editor Paul Klebnikov released multiple articles exposing top Russian oligarchs and their shady businesses. His article received mixed reactions from the public, but what they did to him next changed the course of his life forever. Here's another 10 times journalists mess with the wrong gangs. Elidio Ramos Zarate This is Elidio Zarate, a freelance Mexican journalist recording the violent attacks and burnings that sprouted from a protest. But just a few hours after this pic was taken, Zarate was shot dead. Years before this happened, Elidio worked for Mexican media house El Sur. There he worked in a popular tabloid style of crime journalism known as Nota Roja. But while working at El Sur, Ramos did some freelance writing and publications under his name. He was known within Oaxaca, Mexico for his ability to provide striking details in his story. Some say this was only possible due to his connection with an unknown figure in the crime underworld, but none of this was ever confirmed. In the weeks leading up to his death, Elidio was appointed by the head of El Sur to cover the protest by the CNTE Teachers Union, who were protesting against the government for arresting the union leaders, along with making radical changes to Mexico's education policy, involving how teachers would be evaluated for pay. Now, although he was a known crime reporter in the region, he wasn't, according to his colleagues, threatened before he covered the CNTE protests. But it seemed as though reporting on this protest didn't sit right with everyone. June 18th, 2016, a day before he was killed, masked men at the protest threatened him, as well as other journalists taking photos of vandals in the area. Now, these men didn't really behave like cartel sicarios. They seemed to be members of a local gang, and as such, he didn't really care. But not heeding to their warnings cost him his life. The next day, violence between police and protesters erupted, and as a result, eight protesters were killed. A bus was burned, and more than 100 police and protesters were injured, with over 20 people being arrested. Zarate was photographed taking these pictures of the incident to make up his report. However, hours after, he was approached by two men on a bike outside of a convenience store. He was then shot twice, one in the head and one in the neck, killing him on the spot. The killers also shot and killed two other people around Zarate before making their escape. And given that this protest had nothing to do with Mexican cartels, his death was linked to the local street gangs that escalated the violence within the area. It's been years since his death, and up until the time of making this video, all investigations have failed, and not a single arrest has been made. Moses Sanchez Cerezo we go to Mexico now, where on January 2nd, journalist and activist Moses Sanchez was abducted by armed men from his home in the state of Veracruz. 7.30 p.m. on January 2nd, 2015, three vehicles arrived at the home of Jose Moses Sanchez Cerezo, located in Gutierrez Rosas neighborhood of Medellin de Bravo, Veracruz, Mexico. According to his neighbors, at least nine armed men wearing ski masks descended from their vehicles and stormed into the house seeking them. Sanchez was sleeping in his bedroom upstairs while his wife was watching TV with her grandchildren. These men had broken several doors inside the house and trashed some of the rooms before taking Sanchez's computer, camera, and cell phones. The gunmen then forced them into one of their vehicles before driving off to an unknown location. The rest of this story will leave you devastated. But first, who exactly was Sanchez Cerezo? And why were these assailants after him? Cerezo was one of Mexico's oldest journalists, beginning his career in the early 90s. He began as a house newspaper distributor for Notever, one of the most read newspapers in Veracruz, before he gained interest in journalism. Years later, he began participating in several civil society projects in his neighborhood of Medellin de Bravo, where he eventually started his own weekly newspaper, La Unión. However, unlike other journalists, Cerezo didn't make money from being one. He catered for his family by being a taxi driver and owning a grocery store in the same vicinity. Yet he continued uncovering stories against Mexican authorities and their corruption. For this, he became a hero to his people, but an enemy to the government. And here's the catch. Killing Cerezo wasn't going to solve anything. For what it's worth, it was going to solidify allegations that the government had orchestrated the deaths of multiple journalists. So instead, they would kidnap him, torture him a little bit. But this was just as good as killing him, because back home his family and neighbors pulled all the strings to get him back. 
It would contact federal military agencies, the Secretariat of National Defense, and the offices of the Attorney General of Veracruz to formally issue a complaint for his disappearance. But sadly, none of those brought Cedezo back. January 24, 2015. Sanchez's corpse was found by Mexican authorities inside a plastic bag in Manlio Fabio Altimerano, Veracruz. His throat was cut open and he was decapitated while still alive. His body was mutilated, placed in a plastic bag, and abandoned at the location it was found. The scene was so gory that his corpse was completely unrecognizable. Investigators had to hydrate his fingers to see if his prints matched the ones they had on file. His son was also called in to identify the butchered up body parts before officially reporting his death. Now, the day before, authorities arrested Clemente Noe Rodriguez Martinez, a former municipal police officer and alleged drug trafficker, along with five other members of a gang who were alleged culprits in his murder. They confessed to having participated in the kidnapping and murder of Sanchez and directed authorities to the victim's location. It indeed brought an end to his family's mental suffering, but at what cost? Giuseppe Fava il problema della mafia è molto più tragico e più importante, è un problema di vertice nella gestione della nazione ed è un problema che rischia di portare alla rovina, al decadimento culturale definitivo l'Italia. During an interview with Enzo Biaggi on national TV, Italian journalist Giuseppe Fava exposed the Italian mafia's corruption in the government. However, just one week later, he was murdered. On September 15, 1925, Fava was born and raised in Palazzolo Acredi, in the province of Syracuse, Sicily. He moved to Cantania to study law, and after graduating in 1947, he ditched his degree to take up a full-time job as a professional journalist. In 1952, Fava became the editor-in-chief of the Espresso Sera daily newspaper in Cantania, the main city on Sicily's east coast, and in 1980, he assumed the same position at another newspaper, Giornale del Sud. While working there, Fava would build a team of young journalists to turn the paper into independent investigative journaling, digging into crimes orchestrated by the Mafia that other newspapers were scared to report on, for fear of what might happen. But here's where things took a sharp turn. The owners of the newspaper Fava worked for had deep connections with the Mafia. As a result, Fava was fired under the guise of him releasing false publications. Consequently, he took his team of journalists and founded another magazine called E Siciliani, which translates to The Sicilians. The magazine exposed connections between mafia politics and business in Catania. And in an article titled The Four Horsemen of the Mafia Apocalypse, Fava exposed the corruption and political influence peddled by the four mob bosses that tied together the local mafia, high finance, political figures, and big companies operating in Sicily. It was a bombshell, revealing in deep detail things regular people in the community had no idea about. And it was at this time that these mafia gang bosses decided Fava had to go. January 5th, 1984, exactly one week after his interview with Enzo Biaggi, Giuseppe Fava was shot dead while he was waiting to pick up his granddaughter, who was rehearsing for a theater comedy. Investigators had no lead on his murder, and no arrests were made until 10 years later, when Maurizio Avola, a former high-ranking member of the Mafia, confessed to killing Fava. Avola claimed his uncle, Nito Santa Paola, another Mafia boss, had ordered the hit, and as such, Santa Paola was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. Paul Klebnikov Paul Klebnikov was a chief editor for the Russian edition of Forbes magazine when he was shot from a passing car. Klebnikov was the high-profile journalist and chief editor of the Russian edition of Forbes. However, after 10 years of working with the giant media house, he was murdered for digging too deep into the affairs of top Russian oligarchs. Born June 3, 1963, Klebnikov was raised in New York by his aristocratic family. Growing up, he was known to be a daredevil and always wanted to pursue a career as a journalist. He graduated with a degree in political science from the University of California and then got his PhD from the London School of Economics. In 1989, Klebnikov joined Forbes, gaining a reputation for investigating murky post-Soviet business dealings and corruption. 
In line with this, he published a cover story for Forbes, where he compared Russian tycoon Boris Berezovsky to the Sicilian Mafia in Italy. Klebnikov casted a dark shadow on Berezovsky's automobile business and called it the tip of his golden iceberg of wealth. In turn, Boris sued Forbes for libel, while Klebnikov woke up every morning to more death threats than the one he had the day before. Fearing for his life, he left Russia to be with his family in Paris. But once he got there, he doubled down on his story, creating a 2,000-paged book on how former Russian President Boris Yeltsin and a few other businessmen orchestrated the robbery of the century by the privatization of businesses and other corruption schemes. Just when it seemed he was really pushing the boundaries, Klebnikov released a second book, sparking even more controversy. It was at this juncture that he assumed the role of chief editor for the Russian edition of Forbes. However, due to his wife and children's reluctance to relocate to Russia, Klebnikov, in agreement with them, decided to take the position for just one year. Unfortunately, he didn't even make it through the next six months. On the night of July 9, 2004, Klebnikov was attacked as he left the Forbes office in Moscow. Unknown assailants would fire four gunshots from a drive-by. He initially survived, but died at the hospital after being transported by ambulance that had no oxygen bottle. And after he experienced the delay with the hospital's elevator breaking down, his death would spark outrage, even from the U.S. government. But one question remained unanswered. Who killed Paul Klebnikov? Well, according to his co-writers at Forbes, they believe his killing was a result of his last story that detailed the 100 richest people in Russia. While some others believe Berezovsky paid off a group of gang members to get rid of him. In 2006, prosecutors blamed Chechen rebel leader Kozy Ahmed Nukayev, who was the subject of Klebnikov's second book, as the man behind his murder. In turn, three Chechens believed to be members of a local street gang were arrested, but were shockingly acquitted by the court, after no substantial evidence was provided to convict them. Over the years, the investigation into the murder of Paul Klebnikov has been ongoing. A little progress has been made. Giuseppe Impastato May 9, 1978 Italian journalist and activist Giuseppe Impastato was murdered and mutilated by hitmen associated with the Italian Mafia. But what made his death even more heartbreaking was that he was killed in a fashion that mirrored that of his uncle. Born January 5, 1948, Impostato was born into a mafioso family in the then province of Palermo. His father, Luigi Impostato, was a close friend of the mafia boss, Gaetano Badalamenti, while his uncle, Cesar Manzella, was also a high-ranking mafia boss. However, Manzella's death shaped Impostato's life in ways he may never have imagined. In April 1963, TNT bombs were placed beneath Uncle Manzella's car by their rivals. And as he drove along a highway, his car exploded and his remains were found stuck to lemon trees hundreds of meters away. The incident traumatized Impostato. He couldn't come to terms with the fact that being part of this mafia could lead to such a deadly consequence. And in that moment, he made a promise to himself, a promise to sever all ties with his family and to do everything in his power to bring them down. In 1965, he founded the newsletter La Dea Socialista and led the anti-mafia movement in Palermo for about three years. But here's the thing. Impostado knew that he couldn't do it with violence, so instead, he would use humor and satire as a weapon. In his popular daily radio program, Onda Paza, he mocked politicians and mafiosos alike, while exposing their heinous crimes and dealings. Being that he was once a part of them, he had access to unparalleled information, and the mafia boss, Pandalamenti, began seeing him as a threat. Impostato crossed the line on several occasions, exposing the deepest, darkest crimes the Mafia had orchestrated. Badalamenti wanted him gone, but for the sake of his uncle never ordered his assassination. However, once he died in that car accident, Badalamenti immediately instructed his men to get rid of Impostato as well. May 9, 1978 Giuseppe Impostato was kidnapped and taken to a railway line. His body was stretched over the tracks and TNT explosives were attached to his body, a close resemblance to the way his uncle was assassinated. 
and during the night the bombs would detonate, bringing an end to his life and causing serious damage to the city's railway line. By morning, the Mafia had manipulated the media into tagging Impostato as a suicide bomber and left-wing terrorist. But after a few years, the truth came out, and Badalamenti was handed a life sentence for ordering his assassination, along with a host of other crimes. Ruben Espinosa Anger and dismay over the killing of yet another journalist in Mexico. Hundreds turned out in the capital on Sunday to protest the death of Ruben Espinoza. The death of Mexican photojournalist Ruben Espinoza sparked nationwide outrage by his colleagues. But even that couldn't bring justice or any kind of solace for the brutal manner in which he was killed. For the majority of his career, Espinoza concentrated on social movements and protests. He became a journalist in Mexico City while working for a brand known as Eclipse Photo. From there, he moved to Jalapa, Mexico to continue his career. However, Jalapa is literally the worst place to be a journalist in Mexico, even worse than Sinaloa. So after a few months, he sought refuge in the state of Veracruz. And even though the journalists here experienced their fair share of violent attacks, Espinoza didn't back down from his passion. He became a correspondent for Proceso and Cuarto Oscuro magazines, voicing his opinion regarding the treatment of journalists in Mexico. However, for every story he covered, he received at least two death threats. In 2012, Espinoza covered a student protest against the then-governor of Veracruz, Javier Duarte. During the protest, Espinoza was grabbed by a random stranger who uttered these words, Stop taking pictures if you don't want to end up like a Gina. For context, Regina Martinez Perez was also a correspondent for those two magazines, but was murdered after reporting on a state official. Nevertheless, Espinoza went ahead to release a photograph of Governor Javier Duarte, showing him wearing a police cap with his stomach hanging over and below his belt. He received countless death threats for this, while the governor was personally outraged by the picture and article. He sent people to find and buy out all the prints released in various locations, and even paid more to get the image taken down from the internet. Once again, Espinoza found himself on the run. He immediately fled Veracruz and sought refuge in Mexico City, where most journalists who've been victims of death threats or assault seek asylum. But even there, his safety wasn't guaranteed. July 31st, 2015, Ruben Espinoza was found dead along with four other women. All five bodies showed signs that they were killed, execution style. Espinoza became the eighth journalist to have been killed in Mexico in 2015, and the 15th to be killed under Duarte's politics. But one thing that stood out in those deaths was that no reasonable culprit had been punished. Also, after his death, protesters would gather holding cameras and signs stating, not one more, directing their message to the governor. And obviously, he must have sent these men to carry out the murder, but who exactly were these men? One corrupt cop arrested in connection with the incident gave a hint that the men contracted were part of a small gang operating out of Veracruz. Could it be true? We might just never know. Jesus Adrian Rodriguez Amaniego Back in the 90s, Jesus was one of the toughest journalists in Chihuahua, Mexico. He was working as a radio journalist and was a former crime reporter for the newspaper El Heraldo de Chihuahua in Chihuahua City. However, after 15 years in that business, something devastating occurred in his life. Every Saturday, he would participate in a reporter's desk program at the station. And during this program, he would report various crimes happening in Chihuahua. Samaniego, in particular, criticized these criminals, saying things that left his target audience upset. And unfortunately for him, it cost him his life. 7.30 a.m. December 10th, 2016, as Samaniego was leaving his home, located in Santa Rosa, in Chihuahua City, getting into his car, headed for his weekly Saturday radio talk show, two unknown men would drive by and shoot him at least eight times with 45 caliber rounds, killing him on the spot. Before that happened, Jesus was looking into a case, two people being arrested by federal agents allegedly inflicting torture and forcing him to make a confession under duress. Some say he was taken out by contract killers preventing him from blowing up the story, while others say he was exposing too much on his Saturday talk show. But whichever case is true, 
the death of this journalist caused some huge backlash against the Chihuahua government. With Samaniego becoming the 13th journalist to have been killed in Chihuahua since 2000, a huge influx of people flooded the streets protesting that the government should investigate deeply into his murder. Now they did launch an investigation, but the outcome wasn't far from the usual. Investigators stated that there weren't any particular threats before the events occurred. However, two men would be arrested, who matched the description given by onlookers who witnessed the incident. But sometime in 2016, they were both released, as prosecutors couldn't build a concrete case against them. And to be fair, these men might have been arbitrarily detained by authorities to appease the crowd and create the appearance of fulfilling their duties. While we'll refrain from passing judgment, the death of Jesus, like that of many other journalists, remains unsolved. Asiya Zebek February 1997, Asiya Zebek, a young Turkish journalist, was cruelly arrested and jailed, with no charges filed against her. And while that in itself is a gross violation of human rights, her story gets way deeper than that. February 22, 1997, 26-year-old journalist Asiya Zebek was one of 19 people picked up without warning by Turkish authorities. And as of right now, all but two have been released, or are dead. But that's beside the point. Zebek was falsely accused of having connections with a banned Turkish Communist Party, which, according to Turkish law, carries a maximum prison sentence of 18 years. After her arrest, the police raided her home and claimed to have found incriminating documents. But in reality, these men found harmless household items that could have easily been nail polish, now, who knows what these men had planted in her house? Nevertheless, she wasn't released. Zepek was held at Security Police HQ in Istanbul for 14 days before being brought before a judge. And even after that, her release was denied. Now, for context, Zebek was born into a traditional Sunni Muslim family in Turkey. She studied political science at Istanbul University, dropping out after two years, having become involved in leftist politics and radical youth groups. It was there that she met her husband, Nerdal Guzel, who was arrested two years after she was, and is serving life imprisonment for terrorist offenses. Zebek exposed multiple government officials in her writings, and killing her would have been an over-the-top thing to do, so instead, they slammed her with a bunch of criminal charges just to silence her behind bars. In one case, Zebek shared a story where she refuted accusations made against her. As a consequence, an officer slapped her face, compelling her to make a false confession. In another instance, she demanded to speak to her lawyer and contact her family, but instead was thrown into a room, tied up, blindfolded, and beaten to a pulp, while incarcerated gang members who were brought in sexually assaulted her. In her words, she said, I was thrown to the floor. It was ice cold against my skin, yet I was sweating. I tried desperately to get free. But when I tried, they kicked me. I tried to shout, to cry, but it was as if the voice I heard wasn't mine. And in my ears, all those words, all those dirty words, they repeated over and over again. When they had raped me, I just lay there. The only thing I wanted was to die. December 2000, when inmates revolted against the government's plans to change the system from one of free association to individual cells, some 30 people were killed in the riots between prisoners, guards, and the military. Zebek was hit by two bullets, one in the back and one in the right leg, which left her paralyzed for months. She was operated on in the prison hospital, had both those bullets removed, and can now walk again, although with a limp and with her general health severely impaired. For months, she remained in deep shock, unable to talk to anyone or eat properly. She was partially losing her mind, and her only saving grace was the journal she kept in prison. This would detail her harrowing experiences, and by the time she was able to pass it to her attorney to make it public, her story changed. It sold almost 10,000 copies, and her case was investigated by the Turkish government. She was immediately released from prison, while eight correctional officers she identified as her attackers were arrested and charged. Sadly, nothing takes away from the horrific experiences she faced for being a mere journalist. Chauncey Bailey For his work as a journalist, Chauncey Wendell Bailey Jr. paid the ultimate price. 
he was on the brink of revealing a groundbreaking story about a criminal gang in California. However, before he could do so, he was murdered. Bailey, originally from Oakland, California, obtained an associate degree from Merritt Community College in 1968 and later got a bachelor's in journalism from San Jose State University in 1972. A few years later, he relocated to Hartford, Connecticut, where he worked at the Hartford Current for three years. Subsequently, he went back to Oakland and contributed to the California Voice until the late 1980s. Now, one thing that made this man special was him speaking out about violence targeting African Americans in the United States. In the summer of 2007, Bailey had written several articles about the problems of Your Black Muslim Bakery, or YBMB. For context, YBMB was an American chain of bakeries opened by Yousef Bey in 1968. It was seen as a model of African American economic self-sufficiency. However, it was later linked to widespread physical and sexual abuse, welfare fraud, murder, and the selling of drugs. After the death of Yousef Bey, the co-owners of the business began looting funds, leading YBMB to fall into debt of over a million dollars. Bailey wrote about this extensively in his freelance publishings, and the new owners of YBMB weren't happy about it. So, they began plotting to get him killed. August 2, 2007, Chauncey was being followed by a white Ford van carrying Devondre Broussard, a 19-year-old YBMB employee who was on probation for a San Francisco robbery conviction. He was driven by Antoine Mackey, a 21-year-old YBMB employee also on probation for selling cocaine. Once Broussard spotted Bailey leaving McDonald's, he brought out his shotgun and fired three rounds straight at him, killing him on the spot. The article Bailey had been working on never made it to the press. However, his killer, Devondre Broussard, confessed to carrying out that murder. He also testified against a man named Bay Four. According to his story, Bay Four, who took over as the CEO of YBMB in 2005, had a hit list of people he wanted to get rid of. People he claimed had done bad stuff to the bakery, and Chauncey Bailey's name was on the top of that list. August 7, 2007. Broussard was arraigned in Alameda County Superior Court on charges of murder and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. He testified for the prosecution at the trial of Bay 4 and Antoine Mackey after taking a plea deal and getting a 25-year sentence for Bailey's murder. He stated in court that he was ordered by Bay to find, track, and kill Bailey before the journalist could print his latest article on the bakery. In turn, Bay 4 and Mackey were both convicted of multiple counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Philadelpho Sanchez Sarmiento Philadelphia was a radio journalist and director for La Favorita radio station in Oaxaca, Mexico. He also wrote articles for the local newspapers, but out of the many he wrote, one stood out. In this article, he placed accusations on a local candidate from the Institutional Revolutionary Party, Oscar Valencia, who was running for political office. The accusation was that he allowed his bodyguards to carry firearms reserved for the Mexican Armed Forces, but despite that accusation, Valencia won the election, while Sarmiento lost his freedom afterward. Every day, he had a stack of death threats on his doorstep. In return, Sarmiento decided to go undercover for a while, but even that couldn't save him from what was coming. 9 a.m. July 2nd, 2015, Philadelphia left his office at La Favorita radio station and was walking down the street headed home. But out of nowhere, an unidentified vehicle carrying two gang members approached, and one fired seven shots straight at him, killing him on the spot. Emergency services were called to the scene and Sarmiento was rushed to the hospital, but he died along the way. After his death, though, was when the real drama unfolded. Then Governor of Oaxaca, Gabino Cue Monteagudo, called on state prosecutor, Joaquin Ruiz Gimenez to conduct a diligent investigation to solve the crime and arrest those responsible. In turn, public officials were accused of often disregarding apparent links between such crimes and the victim's status as journalists. And to make matters worse, they were accused of refusing to admit Sarmiento's death had anything to do with his connection to the media. They even went as far as to say he was a taxi driver rather than a journalist. It's obvious that they were trying to hide something, and we'll tell you why in a moment. 
The Attorney General's office in Mexico was accused of this false justification of him being a taxi driver. Police officials were also quick to blame his death on his presence at a party that featured prostitutes and drug use the night before. And due to lack of clarity in this case, no substantial arrests have been made in connection with his murder. It's no news that Mexico is one of the worst places on this planet to be a journalist. And this video right here is just but a taste of what's going on. Now, despite the increased international attention to the murders of journalists, governments still fail to take action to reduce the high rates of targeted violence and impunity. And despite the whole world waking up to the murders of these journalists, governments are still failing to take action to reduce the high rates of targeted violence and impunity.